Okay, thank you all for the patience. <laughs> Um, so, you know, as I said, AI will take over our world, but at the moment we have to deal with projectors and it's always the same thing. Maybe, maybe once we're done with this problem, maybe once AI is done with this problem, then we can, we can think about them taking over our world. So today I'll be talking to you about natural language processing with Python. And I will focus more on natural language processing because intro to Python was covered today, uh, not today, yesterday, I think, there was a session. And uh, how many of you actually know how to code, know this one programming language? So you're fine, like Python is nothing special, it's not weird language like R, for example, which is one of my favorite languages too. Uh, so you're fine, and I think you'll be able, if you don't know Python, you'll be able to follow. Uh, that's why I will be focusing more on NLP. And if you don't know, NLP also stands for another uh, abbreviation of uh, neuro-linguistic programming, so like some kind of like a hypnosis or something a little bit dodgy. That's not what I will be talking about today. So who am I? I am machine learning strategic cloud engineer at Google. And uh, I used to be a programmer for many, many years. So this is a pixelated uh, picture of me because I had it in Google Docs and I had to extract it as a PowerPoint presentation. So forgive me for that. Uh, if you want to contact me, I'm the only person in the whole world named like this. So any channel can find me, it's probably me. Um, you can email me, you can uh, talk to me on Twitter, you can read my blog if you're interested. How did I go from programming, from, from being a software developer to a data science world? I wrote some blog posts uh, on the topic. If you want to talk about this, feel, feel free to do it. I'm very new to Google. Uh, it's my like beginning, my fourth month this week. Uh, so the concepts I'll be talking to you about come from my previous experience. plan for today, very simple. What are the NLP challenges? What are the tasks? Uh, what can we actually do with the text? What we are currently doing? What people are working on when it comes to natural language processing? And actually, if you look at this picture, it's, it's kind of wrong, but if you write NLP into Google, you can see pictures like this. This is actually speech to text. So this is something completely different. NLP. Is, is working on text. Speech to text is trying to get signals and put it in text, completely different task. Although put together because it is about language per se. Uh, so challenges, then we'll go to very simple classification task. So we'll start simple. I will show you a model that is called bag of words and I will show you how to do it in Python. And then I will tell you if you want to do some more complex stuff what to do next. So there are several NLP tasks and like much more than I, I pointed out here, but the most common are um, when you want to uh, tag the part of speech. So you have a sentence and you want to find out which one is the verb, which one is the noun, which one is the subject, which one is the object, etc. Uh, word segmentation. Um, Named entity recognition. So you have a text and you want to find out the names or the dates or the places, stuff like this. Um, translation. Actually, there has been a lot of great work done on translation lately. Um, question answering, uh, which started with IBM Jeopardy. I will talk about this in, in a second. Uh, sentiment analysis. That's like one of the most simple tasks, but still very useful. Like. Basically, any company that is working with, for example, Twitter feed or uh, emails and want to automate it, sentiment analysis would be very useful. Um, topic segmentation and recognition. So if you want to, for example, if you're a publisher and you want to uh, put text of a topic to the proper audience, you have to know the topic of, the, of, the, of your text. And my... Favorite at the moment, natural language generation. Um, and as I said, there are, there are several more, but those are like the, the ones that are currently researched and used. So 
just quickly, what are the challenges that text is actually providing? Uh, so we know we could, there, there are libraries that could do this, so basically some uh, grammar recognition. So we know which one is the object, we know which one is the, the root, but the problem with machines is, I walk down the street in a hat with a smile, is they don't understand what does it mean. For the machine, that I have a hat and that I have a smile, is exactly the same thing. For, for us human beings, it, it puts a little bit different meaning. There is a meaning. And there is a difference between how machines are processing data than stuff like text and basically uh, seem like they understand. What they are actually doing, they're processing data without this understanding thing. Once this AI thing kicks in and then they will understand, then maybe we could, we could talk about the... Uh, breakthrough, but at the moment this, this is a big difficulty and this is uh, introducing stuff that still needs humans. Another thing is if you think of um, sentiments, so you look at this, uh, it's much better on this screen than this screen. Uh, if you look at the sentence, this film doesn't care about uh, cleverness, wit, or any other kind of intelligent humor, and you're like, taking this sentence uh, word by word, you may think, not you, not you, but the machine may think that this is a positive review. But it doesn't have, it, it's not a positive review, it has doesn't in it. But machine doesn't know which this doesn't refer to, right? This, this negation thing can be put to anything if the machine doesn't understand the whole sec sequence. So this is where machine learning comes in, the AI, uh, all the cool stuff. Um, so basically, if, uh, if you think of artificial intelligence, it can be anything that is uh, learning from any experience. And machine learning is part of in, uh, artificial intelligence. So how, how do they differ? I would say, like, if you're thinking about your uh, algorithm and you're thinking of, like, breadth first search or depth first search, this is applying intelligence to your, uh, your program. Machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence that is basically taking data and learn from examples, generalizing, trying to find patterns. And deep learning, which is very cool and very often like at next to AI is basically deep learning today, kind of is if you look at how many things are solved with deep learning. Deep learning is part of machine learning that is using neural networks. That's, that's basically how you should think of those three fields. And you can see the timeline, like artificial intelligence is nothing new. To be honest, neural networks are nothing new. They are just a hit at the moment because we found a way uh, to, to make them work. So natural language processing, uh, it was always about robots. So um, once, once machines started passing Turing tests, um, well, started, some people could not agree with that, but this replicant uh, was passing the Turing test. Uh, who has ever watched or heard about Blade Runner? For those of you who didn't, this is a, this is a scene from Blade Runner when the, Tur when the humanity test was being performed. And, uh, and yeah, it, it, it was always about robots. And we were like almost there. Google recently, uh, in one of the conferences, if you've seen it yesterday, actually performed a Turing test when uh, booking a hair appointment. Jeopardy with IBM Watson. IBM Watson won Jeopardy. So if you don't know what it is, it's like a question um, being set and you have to like answer it, find, find the best possible answer. So. Uh, IBM Watson won Jeopardy, and that was like a breakthrough, first, a, first thing that proved that AI is a thing. And chatbots, of course, so if you look at this conversation, it's, uh, it's all about uh, traveling, right? So, somebody wants to book tickets and it's like putting some dates, so this chatbot has to extract information about the dates, about the destination, about the origin. 
and uh, it can be done in few ways. So it could be like uh, once you have this information, the chatbot can just have scripted, some scripted response and just fill in the gaps. Or you could think of some more creative ways, like so, so the chatbot responds in a different style and, 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 and basically um, put some creativity, put some randomness into the responses. But don't, don't think it's that magical. Most of the chatbots out there are scripted and they are, their whole job is to recognize the context. Are you actually putting a destination or the date, for example? and extracting those information, making sure you're actually providing them. Still NLP, less magical. I'm sorry I'm taking it away from you. So recently I've noticed the other way around. So there is, there is another uh, way how you could process or work with the language, with natural language. You have data and you want to put them into a nice phrase because data are very, very well understood by machines, by computers, but people may not understand them. Like, if you give them number, it may not be uh, something they, they know. So is it a good number? Is it bad? How does it correspond to, to the previous period? Let's say, if we talk about financial data. Is it the sound? Okay. Uh, so, for example, there is, um, there, there is one company that's working with uh, like older people. They get their, uh, their uh, let's say, Fitbit results, like blood pressure and, and stuff like this, and, and send them reports to their devices in a nice natural language, telling them if, if their health is improving, getting worse, or should they, should they look for a help uh, in terms of, of their health. And there is whole bunch of stuff with creative writing. So there has been a few headlines, and I'm, I'm actually loving it at the moment. Like, research and science is making headlines. Like, people are think of crazy things, which, which always has been in the research field, and now it's making headlines. Now it's all over the internet. So uh, the first algorithm that was uh, basically making up stuff like a Shakespeare, so basically writing as a Shakespeare, uh, writing scripts for Games of Thrones, if you're afraid that everyone will die, the script could like be another episode and another episode, making up new characters. I wrote, uh, I generated some Simpson scripts, and, and it didn't even require a lot of, like, it took me an hour to train the model to actually make sense. Like, th there wasn't real dialogue there. So, I think it's amazing that uh, people are creating stuff that are not practical yet. But you can see the potential. This is what research used to be, right? You're, you're thinking of something that is cool, and then you think, like maybe business people are thinking, how we could use it in the production, how we can make money from it, right? Uh, but now, like this, this phase of just playing around, experimenting, is going to the new. I'm not going to show you any of those cool things today. <laughs> we'll start simple, we'll start very simple model. And uh, there, is, there is this rule with artificial intelligence. Start something very simple and then add intelligence to it. So what we're going to do is to do text classification. So imagine you have tons of articles and you know what categories they are. I will apply machine learning algorithm that will learn how to get those articles and how to assign a category. As I said, it could be useful if you have, uh, if you're a publisher, and um, and you want to present a proper content in front of proper audience. So how does it work? We have documents, we have labels, and then there will be this machine learning algorithm. Once it's trained, we'll use it for prediction. So it's, it will be able to take new text and assign a category. And this is something that is called supervised learning. So it actually needs labels. It needs right answers. Um, why? Because, uh, for example, if you don't have right answers, you don't know how it's performing. There are, there are a few other things that, um, and the, the thing with supervised learning is 
there is this there is this um, thing called overfitting, which basically means learning examples by heart. And the whole point of machine learning is to generalize, find new examples that it hasn't seen during the uh, training phase and predict the proper values. So we'll be doing, I'll be showing you uh, text classification that is based on Reuters data set. The Reuters data set was a data set that was uh, uh, prepared by, uh, by a staff of Reuters and it's out there for non-commercial use. So it's one of the text most uh, hello world data set. And uh, it's actually not categories, it's actually indexes. So people went through those texts and like indexed them. But I will treat them as labels. And having new text, I, could, I, I will be predicting what index it would be. Um, I will also do a trick to, to simplify stuff. So you can imagine that one text has several indexes. I will just take one, the first one. So make it simple. Taking a step back, supervised learning classification problem. Usually, when you have classical machine learning, your data looks like this. You have rows of data, so every example is a row, and every column is a feature. So when you think of uh, uh, when you think of image classification, those would be values of the pixels. Uh, when you think of prices of real estate, those would be like how many uh, how many bathrooms it has, how many bedrooms, what's the uh, area of the house. H how do you do it with text? How do you take a chunk of text of characters and and create features? Basically, this is what this talk today is about. How do you prepare your text data to be ready to be fed into the machine learning algorithm? After that, that's simple. You just take one of the classification algorithms and feed it with, and, and you're done. But this preparation phase is the most challenging. So there is this thing called bag of words, like the simplest algorithm, the simplest way on how to work with text. So we have three documents. One is John likes to watch movies, Mary likes to watch movies too. John also likes to watch football games, that's our second. And then both John and Mary like Titanic movies. Uh, Bag of Words is taking, is, is based on vocabulary. So you go through your documents, get all the words and build the vocabulary. We cannot do anything about this sound. No. Right, okay. Um, so I, I went through all of those words and put them into my vocabulary. So you can see it in this, in this array. And I also sorted them. Thank you. Yeah, I sorted them. Um, and then I made features from them. So I look at every document and check. It's also in my document, my first, first document. No, it's not, so I put zero. It's end. No, so I put zero, etc., etc. Until I went to John, and you may notice that I lowercase all of my words. There is John. There is uh, likes twice because you have likes here and likes here. There is Mary. There is movie, watch, etc., etc. This is how I went from text to features. Now, if I want to go back here, I would just put zero, zero, one, one, zero, zero, two. Uh, that's like the simplest vanilla thing of back of words you could do, but you can do better. For example, there are plenty of words that are no bringing any value, like and, a, they, they are like plenty of them in every document. You don't need them, they won't bring you any information. The fact that they are there will actually noise the data because they will be very common words. So, top words, I want to remove them. And uh, top words is kind of living, sometimes written in stone collection, depending which website you go, depending which company you work for, depending which research facility you are. And then you can see that I removed two. There is no two here, but I left also, right? That's because I just used one of the website stop words uh, vocabulary and also wasn't there. 
but you may decide that also should be removed too. It's, it's really not such a big a deal to just check what works. Uh, so now my vocabulary is much smaller and my vectors are smaller too. Another thing is stemming. So we have John likes, but we have like both John and Mary like. Maybe, maybe we don't need to keep those two words as a separate word. Uh, the same movie and movies. Maybe we just want one word. Maybe we just want the root of those words. So stemming is, is the process of getting the root. And again, there are a few different algorithms, few different universities, research facilities, libraries that are doing stemming in a different way. And um, you might think that like for English language, it should be established what's the root of every word. But again, it's not always something everyone agrees on. Uh, so I just made it up. Like those are not really root words. I just took like, maybe it should be L-I-K. Uh, -I, um, I actually didn't check it. I didn't put it to the stammer. But you get the gist, you get the point. So basically I removed likes, movies, and watched. I, I used the, a base word for that. Um, so my vocabulary is smaller again. And then there is this thing that basically looks scary. So it's a lot of maps and uh, a lot of calculations. This is, this is something that is creating a vector, but not of integers. It's not calculating how many times the word is in the, uh, in the document, but uh, calculating the ratio. So it actually increases when the word appears several times in the document, but if this word is very common in the whole corpus, it actually decreases. So those values will be values between zero and one. Right? Uh, you might have noticed that those vectors are very sparse, and if you, if you choose to work on like classical arrays, you won't be very efficient. So you have to think of a data structure that is doing it in a smart way. This is one example of how you could do it. So you have a row uh, zero, and on the fourth column you have a number nine. This is one of the ways how you could uh, represent your sparse vectors. There are other reasons. This is, this is like the basic, the most common one. But once you're doing it, you have to think of the representation. And then we are coming to the machine fun learning part. But as I told you, this will be very simple. The whole work is actually with preparing the data. So vectorizing in this one category per example is what we do with preprocessing. Then I will train, I will split the data and train and test. And then I will apply learning algorithm. And if you Google it like for text classification, multinomial naive, naive bias is actually performing quite well. Um, so that's what I will be using. And I will use a ready, ready to use class from the library. After my uh, model is, has learned, then we have to check how does it perform. And um, sometimes you may, you may think which data you actually use for scoring. So books are, are telling you that you should the test data, the data that algorithm hasn't seen during the training phase. But I would encourage you to check both because like if you're doing the training and you're not, your algorithm is not performing well on your training data or go, going nowhere with your training yeah. data, that's also a good sign to say like maybe, maybe it's not a good map. Uh, what I want to stress here is this will be like one line when you use library that is that has this implemented the whole the whole burden with when working with text is how to prepare it this will be like the the most coding i will use a library that is called uh, natural language toolkit which is a python library and it gives you a lot of things that you don't have to do it for example once you have a text you want to tokenize uh, words yeah. Sorry. Uh, 
Uh, so natural language toolkit. So uh, if you want to tokenize your your text, it gives you a lot of uh, support. The same of like if you want to, uh, you know, for example, recognize the parts of speech, uh, name entity recognition. It basically gives you also like text classification, but in a different way. It's not using uh, machine learning. Uh, it gives you scammers. I'll be using scammers from this library, and those are the. Uh, what, what other people are talking about and of the Another library, if you're working with Python and machine learning, this is like must have, you have to use it because it has everything. It has all you need for machine learning. And uh, you know what? It also has a structure that is doing this vectorizing of text. So you basically don't have to write it on your own. You just have to tell it which things you want to use. And there is a time for demo. I'm actually going to need, sorry, I'm going to need to use the. Oh yes, that's better. So if you go to the, uh, once you have slides, if you go to the platform that is called Katakoda on my profile, I, I uh, created a scenario. And it's Python with NLP. I'll just change it to presentation mode and type color schema. And like all of the stuff I was telling you are in the scenario. So if you want to refresh uh, what I was saying. Um, so. We'll be doing classification uh, tasks. And uh, first, what I'm going to do is I will show you how I read the data. So I'll just simply do data reader. So what I'm doing here is uh, I'm taking Reuters, which is basically imported from NLTK corpus. It's already there, so I don't have to read the documents. It, it just, NLTK has it out of the box. That's basically why I chose this library, because I don't have to play with downloading files and, and reading them. And um, it's taking, uh, it, it's even uh, split it into train and test, so I don't have to do it myself. So basically, I'm reading it. So if you're interested, just look at this code. Uh, and then I'm, uh, I'm returning my train documents, which will be text, labels. So basically, the first, it's here, the first category of the text, first index, test uh, documents and test labels. And uh, what I'm also doing is I'm cleaning it from the categories that are not in a train test. So uh, um, there are more categories than, than in a train test. So let's start with Python. And let's read the data. So I'm basically running the code I've just shown you and it's reading the Reuters. So, so I'm now having the everything in my uh, variables here. So the first thing, I can, I can just look at the categories. So we have 74 categories, and like, kill me and tell me what do they mean. You have to go into the uh, Reuters uh, documentation to actually understand, but you, it gives you the feeling that those are more indexes rather than categories of the text. Um, let's have a look at how one of the documents look like. And it's like a lot of text. You can see that there are some like um, leftovers uh, with maybe HTML. Maybe it was scraped from, it, it's weird. It's a lot of numbers because those are reports. So Reuters is reporting a lot of numbers. Uh, so this is how like one of the documents uh, look like. If you want another example, just change the index. And then I'm using what I just said, the structure I'm using the structure that is called count vectorizer, and basically uh, using a function that will uh, that I'll be reusing when I when I send the vectorizer, it will uh, print out my vocabulary. So we will sh we'll see step by step by adding stemmers and, and et cetera, et cetera, how our vocabulary is changing. So I'm now creating 
a very vanilla vocabulary, and you can see how big it is. It went through all of the documents and basically used every word in every document. And the code is very simple. I just use count vectorizer and use my function here to display it. That's not what we want. There are so many words, we, we can do better, right? But that's, that's what vanilla gives you. It gives you something. Basically, it, it could be usable. So first thing, I want just 500 most common words in my vocabulary. I don't care about the rare words. I only want 500 most popular words. So what I do, I use max features. So instead of just creating a class, I'm using max features. And let's see, yeah, that's better, right? So I just used 500, so you can, a human being can handle it, right? But there are, there are weird stuff here, like, um, I don't want those numbers here, right? Those are probably not interesting stuff. So maybe I just want not alphanumeric stuff, but just characters that are from A to Z. So what I can do is I can say, use this regular expression to fit the word. Let me just do it. See, I, I use token pattern and the regular expression. So basically, use only words that are characters of the length at least two. And it's great, no numbers now, but I have stuff like by, but, at, and, which is stop words. Those, those are stop words, I don't want stop words. That's great, I can just say, let me go back to the code. I can just say, use stop words English. So this class uh, takes either a null value, string basically handles only English, or you could put there a, an array of stop words of your choosing. So if you want different stop words than the authors of this class, you, you could do it. You could just say like, I don't want a, and, and by, and that's it, those are my stop words. Or you could uh, download the whole arrays from, from somewhere and, and just put it here, and it will work. So you can see that I don't have stop words now, right? Those are like valid words. So what else can we do? Uh, so I can see stuff like change and changes, um, commodity common, currency currencies, which is different than current, so you can see what difficulty stemming can introduce. So, yeah, you could do stemming, and I'm using a stemmer from NLTK this time. So first of all, I'm, I'm, uh, I will just do it and, and explain it to you. So it will take time. Uh, so I'm using Porter stemmer from NLTK, and with count vectorizer, and it's a little more, more complicated. I'm building analyzer, and then create my count vectorizer, adding this analyzer function here. And now you can see that there is, there are stems here, right? You see that not all of the words are the whole words that we are we can find in English dictionary. So yeah, maybe maybe that's it. Maybe we are happy. We could try to sp spike it up and and do stuff like this. Let's see how like example text look like. Very sparse, right? And you can see that I actually had to do it to array because the uh, representation inside of the count vectorizer is not an array, it's not a sparse array, it's a different uh, representation because it can handle sparse data. So this, like when I first saw it, like this doesn't look right because, you know, a lot of zeros, why, why a lot of zeros? First of all, because this document uh, has a lot of words that we've thrown out from our vocabulary. And second of all, because a lot of words are not appearing in this document, so that's why. So basically, if you look, like one, two, three, maybe 10 words, maybe 12 from the whole 500, and um, yeah, you have, to, you have to think of this sparse representation if you do it. But if you're using proper libraries like this one, SK, uh, Psychic Learn, then maybe you don't because it's doing it for you. So this carry, 
vectorization. Very good news. There is a class for that. You don't have to write it yourself. I encourage you to understand what it does. But basically what, what I've learned from the previous one, I'm using exactly the same code, just using different class. So instead of count vectorizer, I'm using PFIDF vectorizer. And it will create something like this, but there won't be you know, just integers count of words. There will be values from 0 to 1. Let's see. The vocabulary is exactly the same. So it, it works in exactly the same thing. Just the values are not ones and twos. This is a sparse vector that has a float value. Now, we have our vectors prepared for machine learning. Let's do some machine learning. I'm using, uh, again, uh, psychic learn, and I'm using multinomial naive bias. And it just did this very quickly, just like that. So I used two, uh, uh, two representations. I used, I used the uh, count vectorizer and I used TDIDF. So I have two models. Let's see how those models are working. So first of all, I'm taking the test data and I'm transforming it to this specific representation, vectorized representation, and then I'm using the scoring. So basically, I didn't do much. I like said stop words, um, characters, so I, I get rid of numbers, um, stemmer, and without basically tuning or anything, you've seen 74 categories. This is pretty good accuracy for, for not doing anything, for not like working heavily on my uh, machine learning algorithm. Uh, so you can see that it actually performs uh, quite nicely even like testing scores usually with your first try, it's usually lower than the train test, but you can, you can then see where, where there is a way for improvement. So that's basically, uh, as I promised, two lines of code were machine, learn, machine learning. And there are two lines of code because I used two different representations. Um, and unfortunately, <laughs> what, what people uh, who are not working with machine learning daily basis, uh, and, you know, like with this uh, joke, what other people think I'm doing, what I'm thinking, I'm doing what my parents think, this is unfortunately, <laughs> uh, like every day, you're preparing data, you're creating features, you're cleaning it, you're coming back. And most of the times, uh, you're not tuning the algorithm itself. You're doing feature engineering. You're working on your data. You're getting more data. You're cleaning more data. And it can take up to like 90% of your time. The cool part, which is doing machine learning, is unfortunately, um, well, less, uh, we, we do it less often. Uh, but we do it for the school part, so that's, that's why we're doing it. So uh, that's the demo, that's what I wanted to show you. You could go to the website and just run it yourself or experiment or like think of other ways how you could prepare the data. Um, and I will go back to the presentation. And we'll do a quick summary. So there are many things that can go wrong with this model, but it is a simple model that works very well for text classification, if you don't want to do like more complicated stuff. Uh, and for example, uh, like with uh, spam detection. But if you want more context, if you want more meaning, if you want to generate text, you have to think of something more complex. So the limitation of this are like, um, you, you actually have to spend a lot of time on this data preparation. But with NLP, that's basically not just this model, that's every model. You have to, you have to put 80% of your code into preparing the data. Uh, you need to think of your vocabulary very uh, carefully. Like, is this 500 enough? Maybe it's not a number that, that will drive information. Um, you, think, you need to think of sparse vector representation unless you're using a library that is already doing it. But if you're writing it yourself, then 
and you have to think of it, uh, especially if you have a lot of text. And basically, if you want to do uh, something meaningful with the text, you have to have a lot of text. Um, you have noticed, and I told you that I sorted my vocabulary, so the order of the sentence doesn't matter in the bag of words, right? So you, you may basically lose the context. Uh, we've thrown away stop words, which are like not, right? Every not, doesn't, don't, want will be taken out. So you are actually limiting some of the information. Uh, so if you want to do like sentiment analysis, that's probably not a good model. Uh, word stemming. Imagine you want to do um, text generation. So you want to say, like, I was generating this uh, Simpsons uh, script. You want to say, um, Mary, and, uh, Mary and John like watching this movie, but John likes to watch the movie. So if you're actually, if your output is text, stemming won't be a technique that will be useful for you because you want to, you want words to, um, to have different forms. And there are different representations. As I said, back of words is, is the, like the simplest one, the first one that you should try if you're, if you're uh, figuring out how to work with text. And there are other that are uh, very interesting. Um, there are other that can capture the word relationship. So this was, a, uh, this was the example that also went to headlines. Uh, representing words as vectors this is 2D representations, but it's usually around like 300 dimensions. Um, you can find out uh, relationships. So if you have this vector that is taking from king to man, and you apply this to queen, you should get woman. You should get the vector of the values that will represent the woman. Um, for example, with times, like slow, uh, with graduate, slow, slower, slowest. If you apply this vector to another adjective, you should get proper words representation. Um, Paris, France. You have a capital, you have a country. Again, you're taking a vector, applying to another word. Um, this is very interesting. This is like, you know, maths with words. This is applying algebra. I, I find it cool, but I'm, I might be weird. Um, there are other representations that are actually working character by character. So you're not tokenized the, uh, the whole text word by word, but you're like figuring out what's the next char character. And for example, it it's, it's one of the approaches when you think of translation. When you think of translation, you may think of basically your neural network learning a new language. And after like few iterations, you'll think, oh, it's actually like, generating words in French, for example. <laughs> and the context is here very, uh, very important, especially like with translation. Uh, because if you, if you imagine you're translating word by word, you won't get good results. Sometimes your input will be different length of your output with translation. And uh, then more sophisticated algorithms like neural networks are coming into play. So you could think of uh, something that's called uh, recurrent neural networks and uh, the subset of them, which is called long short term memory. Um, it's not that long, this memory, but it's capturing the context. So if you think of generating, um, let's say this verb like and likes, it can actually take the context if this is a plural or singular and, uh, and generate like or likes depending on the context. So. Again, bug of words, very nice, very easily graspable model, but yeah, very few uh, like practical, um, except for like spam and text classification um, application of it. And when you're thinking of NLP, and in the days like this where neural networks are making headlines, uh, this is what you will get: LSTMs, RNNs. RNNs actually well, are like a vanilla version of LSTM. So to summarize, talk a little bit to you about uh, NLP challenges and my favorite 
about research making headlines. Uh, I've shown you the bag of words in theory, in, in Python, in the demo, which I'm encouraging you to try uh, on your own or like look at the code and, and experiment with your own computers. And um, we talk a little bit about limitations, about concerns you have to take to, uh, to do it for real, to do the amazing things. And uh, that one disadvantage is like you have to have a lot of text for your algorithms to, to learn well, but then you can do amazing things. And I think uh, like with computer vision, we're kind of done, like everything is working. With NLP, there are so many things for, for the research facilities for us to discover and to be proud of. So stay in touch, don't be a stranger. If you have any questions, uh, I'm pretty responsive, so, so you just, just do it, just ask me anything. Uh, go to Katakoda to, to try out the scenario, and yeah, stay in touch. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Yeah? <laughs> uh, my Simpson thing. Uh, so I, uh, I had a sample of like uh, scripts from Simpsons, and it was a conversation between uh, Homer and uh, this guy that has a bar. Uh, Mo, yeah. So um, it, it wasn't anything meaningful, but it was a conversation that you could think like, yeah, that, that's something that could end up in Simpsons. Maybe not as sarcastic and intelligent as Simpsons would be because I only trained it for like an hour. But yeah, it was fun. It was, it was really fun. It's like this feeling that you get, oh, I have a power now to, to convince this machine to learn something. And I did this. Anything, anyone else? If you have any questions, just grab me afterwards. Thank you.